Hi. Welcome to Kaiser Health News and our discussion today. I'm Julie Appleby. I'm a reporter here at KHN, and I'm here today with Dr. Georges Benjamin, who is the Executive Director of the American Public Health Association. Today, we're going to talk about the hurricanes that have recently hit the mainland United States and the U.S. territories in the Caribbean, including Puerto Rico. As we all know, there's been a great deal of physical um, damage on uh, the mainland and on the islands. Uh, areas have flooded. Homes and businesses have been destroyed. A big chunk of Puerto Rico is still without power and water. These kinds of natural disasters raise both short-term and long-term public health threats. And today we're going to discuss those with Dr. Benjamin, who has led the Public Health Association since 2002. Dr. Benjamin, let's talk first about Florida and Texas and the mainland, and then we'll turn to Puerto Rico, because I imagine there's some similarities and some differences. But what are the immediate public health threats on the mainland following these hurricanes? You know, Julie, what usually uh, we tell people to worry about the most, of course, is the injury. Uh, as people are going back into their homes, there are um, things you can step on. The water is still there, and um, um, mold is, is still a big issue. Um, that's both a short-term and a long-term problem. Um, just um, going back into your, your home and, and the electricity, the threat to be electrocuted. You know, there's still power lines down. I mean, when you left your home, you left things plugged into the wall. And there might be water um, in your home as well, right? Yeah, there's right? still water. And so people just have to be very, very careful. Um, remembering that, that uh, things have spilled. There's all kinds of, you know, chemicals in the water and things that, that range from, you know, very caustic stuff to just significant irritants. Um, so then the eye, just getting your stuff and cleaning it and, um, and not injuring yourself are the, are the, are the, the immediate things. And there's a range of infectious diseases um, and making sure that um, you have safe water to drink and uh, food that hasn't been contaminated. And, you know, people are always wanting to save what they can. Right. And, right. you know, that's human nature. Um, but to try to just make sure that you're, you're eating, eating stuff that's safe to eat is, is very, very important. Hmm. Uh, and then there's a, you know, a range of infections. So right now we're, we're in just getting influenza season. So, of course, people still need to get their flu shot. Today, you know, kids would be going back to school and, and getting their um, vaccination certified. And, of course, we'll all be working to get our flu shots. And in some cases, that got interrupted by these storms. Yeah, but that, 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 you know, the kids didn't go back to school in Houston for quite some time. They're certainly not going back in Puerto Rico. Let's talk a little bit about the short-term effects in Puerto Rico, but then we'll kind of bounce back and forth. Are there similarities? And is there anything different or additional uh, in Puerto Rico that we can see with sort of immediate threats to public health? You know, the, the immediate di difference in certainly Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands um, is the fact that they're um, waterlocked and, you know, people can't leave. You know, if in um, Florida and Texas you could uh, eventually get in the car or get on a plane and go to your relatives who live somewhere else. Right, right. Um, and while that certainly at some point is possible for both uh, the islands and the Caribbean, um, most people are stuck there. And um, not just stuck in those urban settings that we see, but stuck up in the mountains. And their ability to get to services and those kinds of things are, are a big problem. And then, of course, while everyone's going to have some delay in getting return of things like electricity um, and, and critical life services, um, theirs are going to be much longer and much harder to do, again, because they are, they're locked. And it, as many supplies as you bring and put on the, the dock, um, they didn't have to be distributed. So the distribution systems uh, are quite different um, because if you think about it, just in the Washington, D.C. area, what happens if certain roads get blocked, your ability you to get You can't get, get anywhere, work. right, right. So you yeah. can't get anywhere on the island, and there's a shortage of fuel in some cases as well, at, at least That's initially. Right. So that was, hard. that was making it difficult. So let's jump back to the mainland as well. So some of those were immediate threats. What are you hearing now? It's been a little while. There's been a lot of recovery going on, but what are some of the public health concerns that are coming up now, you know, a week or two or three out? What, 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 are, what are we seeing now? St still injuries. Mm -hmm. um, people still are still getting injured. They go back to their homes and they're okay. Yeah, people still clearing brush mm -hmm. and moving things and, you know, um, back injuries, um, you know, tragically train saw injuries, all those kinds of things continue to happen. Um, mold is going to continue to be a big issue. Now, why is mold an issue? What, what does mold do? What's so... So mold, mold is, is, is a toxin, is a particularly respiratory toxin. And when you get, um, your house gets flooded, um, it gets on the walls. Um, it's a fungus, it grows. 
and it um, causes significant problem, particularly for people that are very sensitive to mold. Um, but you don't have to be that sensitive for it to be a problem. And it's deceptive because hmm. it can get behind things. Uh, and so th those walls just have to be they be torn out. Um, it gets into um, into your furniture. And while you see these big piles of things people have moved out of their house and thrown them away, it's because they're waterlogged and, and um, they'll, they'll get moldy pretty quickly. Hmm. Um, and that that's a big problem. What about bacteria in the water? Um, a lot of people were having to wade through water to get to their homes or to get to safety. Um, what what types of effects have we seen from that? Yeah, you know, the, the, um, the bacteria that's in your water is the bacteria that's in your community already. So it depends on the concentration. Um, so the common things like um, E. coli and salmonella are things that are in sewage mm -hmm. because that is um, often the water that um, gets mixed with sewage or garbage. Uh, and so you just get big concentrations of that. And so hand washing is absolutely essential. Uh, viruses, like the norovirus that we see on cruise ships. Right. Um, and when you bring people together in conjugated settings, um, quite frequently you get outbreaks of, of uh, norovirus. Mm -hmm. Again, great hand washing is, is very important uh, in those settings as well. Hmm. Are we seeing any um, more exotic forms? Um, I, I know that after Katrina, we had some hurricane-related wounds in, that were infected with two types that were pretty nasty. Six, six of those patients died. Uh, are we seeing anything like that either here or in Puerto Rico, or is it a little too early? Do, do, what do we know about some of those types of things? Yeah, you, in the, we have had stories in the past about um, um, antibiotic-resistant organisms or some of the more toxic bacteria and you can see that um, what we're hearing from, certainly from Puerto Rico is leptospirosis. Mm -hmm. At least it sounds like leptospirosis um, of, of people who've that? been exposed. What is, yeah, what is that? Uh, it's an organism that's, that can um, it's, um, often spread through rat urine mm -hmm. uh, and it gets in the water and um, uh, people get ex kind of get exposed to it, particularly people who are uh, at the extremes of, of life, very young, very old, people who are immunocompromised. Um, can be more at risk for some of these diseases. And can that be deadly? That that condition? Oh yeah, it can kill you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And is there treatment? Um, for some of these diseases, they are. Um, some of them are bacteria related. That we can treat leptospirosis. Um, we can treat um, uh, most of of the um, E. coli and Streptococcus. But in some cases, the antibiotic resistance is a problem. But again, that relies on having a health system that's, that's intact and that it, people are able to get to a hospital or a clinic. Is that happening? In Puerto Rico, is it happening? It, it, it sounded like it happened in Texas and Florida. We had we had people accessing health care, right? But what is the difference yeah. in, in those two? Well, the, the big difference is is that um, let's let's look at Houston, mm -hmm. the largest academic health system, you know, right, uh, right. in our country. Uh, it it largely survived. But you remember there were stories of people on renal dialysis uh, that were having challenges to get to get dialyzed, and they were able to come up with some solutions to get them in. Um, we're now hearing um, terrible stories about people um, not being able to get dialyzed effectively um, or as frequently as they really should be dialyzed uh, in Puerto Rico, as an example. Mm -hmm. um, we know that um, health equipment and supplies, uh, many of the hospitals um, are having challenges getting that. And, of course, they were terribly um, um, destroyed in most cases They were um, um, when the storm came through. So... While they've, they've, the comfort there, which is the military hospital ship, and that's taking care of some, some patients, um, the, um, they put some hospitals on the ground, um, basically think of them as MASH hospitals mm -hmm. uh, on the ground. Um, but again, getting those things up and running and having the, 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 the person power to do it, physicians, nurses, technicians to do that stuff, uh, again, getting the supply lines in place so that you have um, clean supplies is also very dependent on the electric grid Mm -hmm. and very dependent on clean water. So all that has to be brought in. It all has to be brought in. Now, did that happen fast enough? And, and if not, why not? What were some of the challenges to getting that help there quickly? You know, um, I, I think there's been a lot of criticism on the speed in which it happened in Puerto Rico um, and the Virgin Islands. And, um, you know, we'll, we will certainly do a, um, an after action to understand better why that was. Um, and you will hear stories about you know, the fact that things are getting better over time. Um, but I'm just putting my emergency medicine hat on. Um, I, don't, I don't certainly think that they, they were able to scale it up as fast as they needed to. Mm -hmm. 
And whose responsibility for that? Is that is that a is that a local responsibility in Puerto Rico? Was it more of a um, international responsibility, a U.S. responsibility? How who was should have been coordinating that and getting that moving fast? You know, this is a partnership. It's always been a disasters have always been a partnership between state, um, local, and the federal government. Mm -hmm. And everybody um, has some role in trying to make sure that happens. I mean, the reason we call them disasters is just that. Mm -hmm. And the idea of a disaster is to go from um, total chaos to control disorder, frankly. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we saw it work well um, on the mainland. We did not see it work very, very well in the islands. Um, there, there are lots of reasons for that. Um, the fact that, you know, you think about it, originally, the um, relief for the Virgin Islands was Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. uh, and then Puerto Rico got hit. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, wiped out, in effect, their ability to help the Virgin Islands. Um, but I, but I, you know, and the fact that we had multiple storms at one time, I don't want to give anyone any excuses, but that certainly played into all of this. Uh, nonetheless, um, at the end of the day, um, what we should learn from this is that we're going to see more and more of this, these kinds of storms with increased intensity, and that means that we have to be much better this time than we, um, uh, in the future, than we were this time. So take the lessons that we learned and apply them in the future, obviously. That's right, and we did that with Katrina. We learned a lot, and those lessons were improved, but still there are a lot more lessons that we'd learned that we didn't do. What about mosquito-borne illnesses? There was some talk about that, but have we seen anything yet with Zika or Dengue or any of these other mosquito-borne things, or is it really too early to, to tell? Um, you know, a little early. Um, now, you know, there's been um, the, the folks in the, the South and Texas, Florida, jumped right on the mosquito um, issue and did began they, spraying. They, spraying? Oh, okay. they sprayed and they um, began trying to, you know, remind people to get rid of standing water to the extent you could. Right. Um, but now you've got these piles of stuff, right? Tires, mm -hmm. places for mosquitoes to breed. So, you know, depending on what happens, you may very well see a kind of an explosion in more uh, mosquito-borne diseases. And what, what, what do you expect? You know, dengue and Zika. Um, now, you know, Puerto Rico has already had its kind of Zika outbreak. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not you see an a increase in that with this storm, who knows? But I would suspect you're going to see other kinds of um, vector-borne diseases. Um, you're going to see um, diseases spread by rodents and other um, and rats and things like that that are that are um, in the community, um, um, just just because that's what happens when you have um, a loss of basic sanitation in the community. And they're not even able to start addressing that until they. I mean, they've got a lot of problems they've got to deal with right now. The main ones, like you said, getting people, getting the hospitals up and running, getting people who need dialysis uh, dialyzed. They need to get the generators and make sure everybody. Uh, they've got a lot of things to do, probably that take precedence before they can start spraying for mosquitoes and things like that. Is that right? Or is that all happen concurrently? Yeah, you know, the, the first priority is always public safety and shelter. Mm -hmm. um, and then as part of that sheltering process, you've got to make sure people have adequate access to food and water. Um, but I've always been of the, of the belief that um, as, as, the, as the storm goes away, one of the first things that really needs to happen is a good public health environmental assessment. Um, what would that be? What that, that, that? that includes um, looking at um, what's happening with sanitation, looking at what's happening with access to, to safe water, um, um, obvious injury um, um, risks. Um, they're going to do this part of the public safety part of that as well. Um, thinking about the healthcare system. How do you get the healthcare system up and running? Doing a, you know, a, a quick assessment of all the hospitals, a quick assessment of all the community clinics. Remember that most healthcare is not delivered at the hospital. Hmm. Right. It's well, at the clinics and clinics, doctors', doctors offices, offices, that type of thing. Yeah, right, and right. those those go away when you have this kind of disaster. I mean, we're talking about the damage to those health those hospitals. Mm -hmm. No one's really talking about the damage to those doctors' offices. Um, and, and how clinics. all the doctors and the nurses and the other health care workers they've had their homes destroyed and such as well. So, are they even available to help? initially or even in the next few weeks, that kind of thing. Everybody's struggling just to, to get their lives back together. That, that's right. You know, we actually had a reporter go around after Katrina hmm. to talk to the public health community. And, you know, those folks are quite heroes. I mean, those the people go to work each and every day pretty much, um, even though they've lost stuff. Um, I was talking with the health officer in Harris County in Texas, 
And you know, many of his staff um, lost things. His house, as I understand it, was flooded as well. Um, and so they've got to come in and take care of us. And in addition, they've got to take care of their own families. You know, one of the things that um, struck me, I was reading the Washington Post this weekend. I don't know if you saw the story, but it was a very moving story by a woman who wrote about her uncle who survived the hurricane in Puerto Rico. But he was so devastated by this. This was his home. His whole family was there. His entire house was wiped out. His beautiful garden was wiped out. He felt like he couldn't provide anymore. And he ended up hanging himself. And it was very, very tragic and horrible situation. But I think it highlights the devastation and the mental health concerns that these kinds of disasters can also raise. So talk a little bit about that. What are, what are some of the public health, both prevention and then after a hurricane happens, how do we help folks um, who have lost everything? Yeah, the, the, the obvious ones are the people with um, chronically and persistently mentally ill that we know mm -hmm. about beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, the family members who are on the edge, um, um, we sometimes know about that and we can, we can generally help them because the family members are aware uh, of that. Um, but it's when people have lost everything and trying to give them hope to be able to rebuild is, is a big issue. And so you see the depression that occurs, not just acutely, mm -hmm. but this is a long-term so issue. Long. And then when your entire island has been wiped out, I mean, in other disasters, it may be a little bit more regional, but, but that whole country, the whole area has been uh, affected, and it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's huge. And yeah. sometimes you lose your support systems. You know, your family members who leave, mm -hmm. um, they may come here to the, to, um, to the, to the, the mainland U.S., um, and you may lose your support systems, and that's, about, that's a big issue. Let's take a step back. Um, let's talk a little bit about public health. Can you can you give us a definition? What is public? What is public health? <laughs> well, you know, we, we talk about public health being uh, a group of people that are interested in creating the conditions so that we can all be healthy, um, and that's very different. So when I was you know practicing as an emergency room doctor, um, and I would um, obviously take care of people who were injured or sick when they came to the emergency department, right? Um, and everybody understands the white coat and the stethoscope right. and taking care of individual care. Um, but in public health, what I am doing is things that influence people in a much broader way. So it's thinking about how to fortify food so that you can get rid of um, birth defects, mm -hmm. thinking about vaccinating large populations of people so diseases aren't transmitted from one person to another, thinking about how to make the roads safer mm -hmm. so that um, automobiles don't crash on the roads, um, how to make firearms safer and make people safer with their firearms, mm -hmm. how to build communities so they're more walkable, bikeable, and green so we, you know, emphasize education, I mean, um, emphasize um, exercise more, um, looking at education because we know that um, a high school education is a determinant of your health. Uh, things like that. Um, so people in public health are across a whole broad spectrum of, of, of occupations, right? Absolutely. So give and us some examples. Who, who, who's a typical public health worker? You know, and many people don't think they are. So the people that pick up your trash each and every day, a piece of what they're doing is public health because they're removing right. that trash, which ultimately would be an environmental contaminant in your community. Mm -hmm. um, the per people that, um, the nurse that gives you a, your vaccination, uh, at least for that moment, she is practicing prevention, mm -hmm. and that's part of public health. Um, the um, people who are lawyers, public interest lawyers, who uh, work to make sure that you have adequate access to services, uh, a, a bit about what they're doing is, is really considered in many places public health. Hmm. Um, the um, people who uh, work very hard to try to encourage us not to smoke, as an example, mm -hmm. uh, or to, um, in, the you know, in, the in the beginning to stop you from smoking, um, or to try to encourage you to quit uh, mm. our practicing public health. Now, who pays for all this? And, and, and maybe we have to narrow it down, but when you think of public health, you think of, you know, state, maybe in local and federal funds, but who, who actually pays for public health? Well, certainly your tax dollars, I mean, um, pay for it. I mean, at the end of the day, you and I pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes we pay through it for taxes, both federal and local. Sometimes we pay through it for fees. So if you have a well mm -hmm. and you have to pay a, a, a fee to have your well checked, um, you're basically paying for that public health service. You may not know that's what you're paying for, but you're, right, right. you're paying for that public health service. Um, when you pay um, this part of your sewer and water bill, 
um, that takes the, the sewage from your home. You're, you know, you're paying for a public health service. You may not think of it that way. Um, when you get clean water, um, you turn that tap, you're paying for clean water, and clean water is a public health service. You may not think of it that way, but it absolutely is. What, what's the federal role, and, and has that changed? I think I've seen some statistics that funding for public health has actually gone down over the last decade or so. I don't know, maybe you could chat a little bit about funding and, and, and whether it's adequate, whether it's rising, falling, staying about the same. Well, our, our healthcare dollar, only about 3% of our healthcare dollar goes for, um, for what we think is classic public health. Um, and, and, and it's always been inadequate. It's always been, you know, we spend what, uh, almost $3, billion, $3 trillion on healthcare and only 3% of that is 3%. In general public health and wow. classic public health stuff. Yeah. Um, and it has gone down, and it's gone down because of federal budget cuts and restrictions on federal funding. Uh, the recession really um, did a terrible job on state and local budgets, mm -hmm. and one of the first things was to go was some of the public health services. Like what? Can you give us an example? What, what kinds of things get cut first? Um, tragically, some of our public health preparedness. For uh, disasters like for we're disasters talking about, for like, like we're hurricanes. About, so, we, so we have cut back on planning? or We've cut back on planning. We've cut back on response. We cut back on some of the jobs for some of the people that actually do the work. Did that change after Katrina? Did, did the funding go back up, or are we still considered to see a decline in planning for these kinds of disasters? Yeah, you know, um, we we were kind of at our peak sometime after 9/11 um, and the anthrax letters. Mm -hmm. um, Katrina um, kind of kept it there, but we we forget, and those dollars have begun to to diminish. Um, both that go to your state and local health departments for some of their work, as well as the hospital preparedness program. Um, we've had cuts in funding for things like tobacco um, funding. You know, there, there was a, when I was a health, state health official, um, the funding for tobacco programs in this country was pretty robust. And those dollars have been cut both at the federal level and the local level. How much of a role does Medicaid play in public health? Do you get Medicaid funds that are specifically for public health? In many ways, the, the Medicaid funds are indirect. So for the clinical part mm -hmm. um, of public health, uh, that funds um, services in clinics, sometimes breast and cervical cancer screening, those kinds of things can be funded through Medicaid. Um, and when they're not, there are generally supplemental grants to help do that for particularly very low-income individuals that may not be eligible mm -hmm. um, for those services. One of the things the Affordable Care Act did was expand access to services. And so we were able to pull back on some of those screening dollars and, and put because them to other Because people had coverage s somewhere else. Is that yeah. what you mean? Okay. As long as, as, long as mm -hmm. the health insurance plan or Medicaid would pay for it. So then you had some extra dollars and you could use them for other things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And didn't the Affordable Care Act also set up some kind of a prevention fund? Or there's, tell, talk us a little bit about what, it, what that is. Yeah, the Public Health and Prevention Fund was originally designated as a $2 billion fund. Mm -hmm. Uh, we grow to two billion dollars over over a few years um, to support innovation in public health and prevention. Remember that three percent I mm -hmm. talked about? Mm -hmm. This was an attempt to put some money on top of that for us to do some innovative things around public health and prevention. And, and we do that because you know most of what makes you healthy doesn't occur uh, inside the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Well, um, big debate in Congress, and there were members of Congress that didn't support it. And with that, they've been cutting back on that prevention fund. In addition to not cutting back on it, but they've been using it for other things. And um, now about 12% of the budget of the Center, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention is now funded by this prevention fund. Hmm. So they basically took the money and they um, are now using it for things that were funded through um, general um, tax dollars. Um, and they're all general tax dollars, but, but non-designated tax dollars. And that creates a problem because if those dollars go away because Congress wants to get rid of the fund or the ACA was um, tragically to go away, suddenly the C CDC will lose 12 percent of its budget. Wow, that's a big chunk. Um, quickly, do you, do you know if the federal budget, what the proposals look like for future funding? What does that look like right now? Um, doesn't, doesn't look well. Um, the Trump administration has, you know, um, verbalized and, and supported huge cuts to not only health care, but public health. Um, the good news is that the Congress, at least right now, is not buying all of those cuts. And so we're all advocating that um, um, we, we should enhance public health services now uh, and not cut them. Um, so we're very worried about the, the future of that. And so we're all, of course, you know, pushing, yelling, screening, calling our members of Congress, um, getting our 
um, governors and other elected officials to call and, and make sure that people understand the impact of what happens to these dollars locally. So we've been talking a lot about natural disasters, but there are lots of other public health issues that come up. And I was thinking of the recent tragedy and the shooting in Las Vegas, and that always brings up a discussion of, of, of guns. Are, is gun violence a public health issue? I know there's some back and forth on this. What, what are your thoughts on that? You know something? If it hurts people or kills people, it's ours. Mm -hmm. That's undisputable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, many, many years ago, uh, I remind folks that we had an epidemic called automobile crashes. Mm -hmm. And it was killing um, our, our kids, our adolescents in particular. And we did everything we could over the objections of the automobile industry at the time, I might add, to make the automobiles safer, right? So they strengthened the car so they didn't roll over, um, so that the engine didn't come into the cab if you had a front-end collision. We put seat belts on. Airbags. Um, airbags. airbags were controversial for a while. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We made the roads safer. We made people safer mm -hmm. driving their cars, right? Um, and we continue to do that, trying to get people not to text and drive. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and, you know, so the car is safer, people are safer in their cars, and the environment safer with cars in it. We can do the exact same thing with, with firearm injury. Now, you will hear people say there's not a single law that will happen that would, would, have, would have prevented that tragedy. But that's not the way public health or any kind of health intervention works. So how would it work? It works because you do multiple things. You make sure that you have um, universal screening programs to make sure that uh, the wrong people don't get those firearms. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, you make the firearm safer. Um, that means getting rid of those um, th those bump things mm -hmm. that they have mm -hmm. um, stocks to, yeah, um, right, right. To, to to make it the, the firearm less deadly. Um, you make sure that um, you have um, since most of these deaths um, are um, people killing themselves suicides. Um, you make sure that you do um, better. Um, um, mental health programs for people that you know um, have challenges. Um, you educate people so there's no firearms in the homes of people who have mental health problems and are at risk. Um, you um, try to look at the, the gun itself and do things to make it safer. You know, the number of stories we have about uh, someone picking up their firearm thinking that it was not loaded, mm. um, or there are load indicators you can put on firearms. Again, the idea is to reduce the risk. Public health is not about absolutes. It's about dramatically reducing the risk. And um, sooner or later, we're going to find um, something that was a red flag that something in our system would have let us, let us know this guy was out there. Um, there's always a red flag. It often takes us time to find it. But if you go back to every one of these mass killings, someone saw something, heard something somewhere, and we missed the red flag. So we've talked a lot about uh, the hurricanes, that type of a natural disaster, and we've talked a little bit about guns, gun issues as well. What about fires? We're seeing um, Northern California and actually parts of Southern California, lots of big fires this year in the West. Um, people are losing their homes. What kind of public health issues do those kinds of wildland fires when they come to an urban area? What 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 is that rate? Yeah, well, you know, the obviously one is, is don't 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 get um, burned by the fire. Mm -hmm. Um, so making sure that um, you have a good education and part of the process of pulling people out of those areas when a fire develops. But um, the air, the breathable air, um, the, the amount of, number of people who have environmentally sensitive respiratory conditions that get exacerbated when that kind of um, air condition you know, occurs from a fire. And that could uh, spread throughout a large area, large region. Uh, so that's, that's why you're right. seeing people wearing the masks and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's one of the main initial so air quality. Parts. Air quality is a big deal. Okay. Um, well, I really appreciate you taking all this time to chat with us today and um, to talk about um, these issues. And we thank you for watching. We're going to wrap it up now. And um, please send any of your comments to our Facebook page.